Welcome everyone. We're just welcoming participants into this uh, Zoom webinar on uh, Good Authority Perspectives on Institutional Governance in Irish Higher Education, organised by the National University of Ireland and the Irish University Association. Uh, we are expecting to hear from the Minister for Further and Higher Education, Simon Harris, TD, uh, fairly shortly, and we have the Chancellor of the National University of Ireland, Maurice Manning here, who will introduce the Minister when he joins us. Uh, but in a moment, we're just when participants are, are all signed in, uh, I will get going with an introduction to our webinar today. You're all very welcome. So the involvement of the Minister and the large interest in this webinar is testament to the importance of higher education governance in Ireland today. And of course, the importance of the higher education governance uh, framework is underpinned by proposals to review and revise our legislation. I'm delighted to see that uh, Minister Simon Harris has joined us, and I'll invite the Chancellor of the National University of Ireland, Maurice Manning, to provide an introduction to the Minister. Good morning, everybody, and, and along with Colin, I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar webinar organised by the NUI and the IUA. Um, now, it's my great honour to welcome uh, our first ever Minister for Further and Higher Education, Simon Harris, to address us. We're all delighted you can be with us, Minister. Minister, you'll find higher education calmer, less fractious than health. <laughs> Not a bad thing for a minister, largely because higher education goes very much under the radar since the media take very little interest in us and there's very little informed comment in the media. So you probably won't be getting too many phone calls to go on the Joe Duffy programme uh, arising out of your time as minister. But you'll find your new brief is no less challenging in the problems it needs you to address and it's no less exciting in the opportunities for real and positive change it offers you. We in higher education, we waited too long for a minister dedicated solely to further and higher education. <clears throat> but in you, we're getting a minister whose ambitions mirror our own, a minister who has shown energy, openness, flair, imagination, and perhaps most of all, stamina in your career. We know too that we in higher education, we must respond with equal openness, with collegiality, with honesty and imagination in working with you. And I believe we are up to that. We are up to working with you and we welcome the opportunities. But Minister, one final word. So often in the past, or unlike so often in the past, it must be a two-way dialogue. It must not be a question of things being handed down. And I know that you are open for that dialogue as well. So I'm confident you're up for it, Minister. It's my great personal pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you. Well, th th thank you so much, Morris, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here today. I really want to, to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to address the NUI uh, and the IUA seminar on good authority perspectives on institutional governance in Irish higher education. And just before I, I get into that, just to to make one brief comment about the establishment of my new department. I am so excited about this. I believe it is genuinely a, an opportunity to have a government department that is focused on the future um, is to fo and to focus on both the economic cohesion in our country into the future, but also the social well-being of our people. I genuinely come to this from the perspective that further and higher education has the ability as a sector uh, to transform lives to transform individual lives, but also family lives, communities' lives, and to end intergenerational cycles of deprivation, uh, to promote excellence, and to enable people to get to where they wish to get to in life. I think for all of the reasons you've outlined, we've had far too narrow a conversation about further and higher education in our country. Um, I think we have to look at the multitude of pathways. We also have to look at how, being very honest, all of us and all of our institutions need to reform in terms of the delivery and the provision of higher education. In many, in many ways, COVID has accelerated um, that process of reform in a way none of us uh, ever, ever, ever could have imagined. But I approach this brief with great optimism. I have found this to be a sector that 
enjoy his collaboration. I've certainly found it to be calmer and more peaceful, as you rightly say, than some of my past political endeavours. But um, I, I have found constructive stakeholders, people willing and wanting to put their shoulder to the wheel. And let's be honest, higher education had been the poor relation in the Irish political system uh, for far too long. The idea that it was hidden in a department along with primary schools and all the important debates and issues that need to be addressed there and pupil teacher ratios and everything else. I think the Taoiseach made the right call in saying we need to pull further and higher education out of the department, but also take the research, innovation and science capabilities out of other departments and bring them together. And if we can get this right, if we can find that sweet spot, we can really create a powerhouse for the future of our country. And I'm really looking forward to working with you. So thank you to you, Dr. Manning. Thank you to Dr. Attracta Halpin and Patricia McGuire and, and all colleagues in the NUI and colleagues in the IUA for jointly hosting uh, this event. I've done many webinars and, and Zoom calls at this stage, but it's still never quite the same as having an opportunity to meet in person. And, and I do hope we get that opportunity soon. Uh, and I'll very much be eager to take that up. My invitation to address you does give me an important opportunity at the outset to pay particular tribute um, to all of your collective efforts during the COVID pandemic. I've just come off a call with many of your own colleagues in the IUA and PIA, people working in, in higher education. I'll be meeting our staff representative bodies this afternoon. And really the incredible work that has been done to keep the show on the road in a very difficult time is something I want to thank you for. 2020 has been a year like no other. It's affected every single one of us. Uh, to some extent, but it, it has had a particular and significant effect on our sector, on our staff and on our students. And as Minister for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science, I've witnessed firsthand your flexibility, your leadership, cooperation, dynamism uh, at a time when it was needed. And most of all, in the most challenging of circumstances, you maintained teaching and learning in radically challenging circumstances. It didn't end. You managed to keep teaching and learning going in different ways. You ensured assessments continued with minimal disruption, and you continually demonstrated the flexibility uh, to meet urgent needs as they arose. I was particularly pleased to read the QQI report recently that showed how educational standards and the integrity of our system uh, was maintained as well during this time. So I want to personally thank you and commend you uh, for those efforts and for that continuing level of cooperation and engagement with my department on priorities as we navigate our way through this pandemic. I must say I am worried about the well-being and welfare of our people, particularly our younger people. And I make that point beyond just the educational point. And I've just come from a meeting where I've asked that we try and give, give our students some semblance of an on-campus experience, some insight into what life post-COVID will look like in terms of our colleges. And I think we, we have to challenge ourselves in that space because I don't think it's adequate for people's university experience to be a box bedroom looking down a Zoom camera. And, and I hope we can collectively make progress on that in the coming weeks and months. Higher education institutions, of course, play an enormously important role in Irish society, and they're critical in creating the skilled labour force that Ireland needs to develop and sustain an internationally co uh, competitive knowledge-based economy, which will be the cornerstone of our COVID-19 uh, economic recovery. Higher education institutions are expected to deliver many important public policy objectives. Their historic functions of teaching and learning have expanded to include being research active, supporting social inclusion, widening participation, and promoting economic, regional, and cultural development. As demand for higher education continues to grow, it becomes increasingly important to ensure that their systems are managed efficiently and effectively. The higher education sector is an engine for economic growth, but it is also expected to be, and indeed is, an instrument of social cohesion and inclusion, and I feel very strongly on that point. In this regard, the sector needs to be enabled to deliver on a very wide range of national priorities, which include the development of very highly skilled cohorts of undergraduate, postgraduate and researchers, widening participation and increasing access to education, the development of lifelong learning systems, and we're not where we need to be in this regard by international comparisons, that will meet the diverse student population needs. Students, learners, citizens come in different shapes and sizes, so too does the provision of higher education need to also. It also needs to facilitate the upskilling of those already in employment and those seeking employment. Higher education institutions are by their nature large, complex organisations that could not effectively deliver on these goals without robust governance 
and management structures in place. I'm sure you'll all agree that good governance arrangements are essential for all organizations, be they public or be they private. And I very much accept that there is a balance to be struck between the autonomy and much valued autonomy of higher educational institutions and their accountability for the public funds that sustain so much of their activity. But I also strongly believe the taxpayer, the biggest customer of higher education institutions, does have a right and indeed a demand to have oversight and transparency when it comes to their money. And I don't think this is something that should be seen in any way as controversial or, uh, or provocative, but much rather a recognition of the fact that if we are to win the argument as to why we must continue to invest in higher education, and we must, and we must also accept we have underinvested in this area, if we're to win those arguments, hand in hand with that will need to come that ability to have robust oversight and transparency. Because along with autonomy, we do require strong governance and accountability mechanisms at an institutional level. I need to be very honest, and again, I don't think you'll disagree with this. The current legislation is not fit for purpose. It doesn't in any way, shape or form reflect the world in which we live in. I'm not sure in many ways it reflects the world in which the last century lived in. Uh, as you'll all know, the Higher Education Authority Act of 1971 established the Higher Education Authority. The world of education has changed significantly since 1971. The world has changed significantly. And that current legislation does not fully reflect the functions, the governance and the authority of a modern oversight or regulatory body for the higher education sector. So I, I want to update colleagues um, this afternoon on the fact that work is ongoing by my department to update the Higher Education Act. And the purpose is to provide the HEA with the necessary authority that it will now require in 21st century Ireland in, in a modern governance structure that is required for higher education. We've already consulted widely on this legislation and so many people on this call will have already participated in this consultation. And I really want to thank you for that. Uh, this has been extremely helpful in determining the shape of the proposed legislation and in identifying key issues. It is now my intention uh, to publish a general scheme of a bill to replace the Higher Education Authority Act 1971 shortly, probably in the first quarter of 2021. Um, I will update Cabinet on this matter uh, in advance of the Christmas recess. The key objective of the new legislation will be to support a high quality higher education system which has that correct balance of institutional autonomy and accountability and also a piece of legislation that will put the needs of our students our learners at its very center the new legislation let me assure you will respect the autonomy of institutions absolutely but it will also give the hea the power to support and assist he institutions if there are governance issues and i use those words support and assist and not accidentally because sometimes I think governance, accountability and oversight is very much seen by, 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 by a gang in the media and in politics as an off with the head type of mantra. That's not what accountability and oversight is. It's about the ability to have mechanisms in place to assist and to support as issues arise. It's important to note that the governance of HE institutions will still remain the responsibility of the institutions themselves. But it is proposed in the new legislation to amend the Universities Act to provide for smaller governing authorities of universities, which are more skills focused and have an increased external membership to reflect a more modern approach to governing boards. It's also proposed that the HEA will be provided with the power to work with institutions to mutually resolve any governance or other issues at an early stage. Again, the benefit of being able to resolve those issues at an early stage. There will be a suite of powers available to the HEA under this legislation. So the aim of the legislation is not to impose sanctions on institutions, but rather give the state the adequate and necessary levels if issues of poor governance emerge. Our third level sector should not be, and I don't believe is, afraid of this legislation. It should, and I believe will welcome it with open arms. I've heard from many colleagues and stakeholders in this regard already, because I do see this as the beginning uh, of a new relationship, a new social contract, perhaps, a mutually beneficial relationship between the state and between our higher education institutions. I'm very conscious that you have a busy agenda in a short period of time, so I just want to conclude by welcoming the NUI and IUA's joint initiative to host this seminar. It's extremely timely for the reasons that I've outlined. And my door is not only not shut, but very much open uh, to continued input and views from you and your members in relation 
uh, to the forthcoming legislation. I very much look forward to hearing the outcome of the discussions today and the various perspectives. Gair Minamalgov. Minister, Minister May, I thank you for that very engaged, very positive uh, presentation. And we certainly will be going through that open door on a very regular basis. Thank you and the very best of luck at what you're doing in the days ahead. Uh, now I'll hand over to Colin Scott, who's been talking to you already, to take you on from here. Colin. Thank you, Chancellor. And let me add my thanks also to the Minister for such a, a wonderful introduction to the themes we're discussing uh, today. Uh, the term governance originates in the ancient Greek word Kubernetes, referring to the steering of a ship. And Plato uses the term uh, Kubernetica to refer to skill in steering. And today, governance is used in a wide range of senses, both in our context today, can be thought of as comprising the rules, structures, and processes for making, overseeing, implement decisions about higher education. My own academic career has been largely devoted to researching and teaching the nature and implications of the fragmentation of governance, especially with respect to regulation. And more recently, I've had some practical governance experience, and we all, in our various governance roles, have situations where we wish we could work through command, autonomous of all others, but find this is rarely possible. The frustration of fragmented governance can be flipped into the virtue of distributed governance and, as the Minister has mentioned, collaboration within which interdependence is a strength, supporting what we might think of as the core purpose of good governance, the steering and making of effective and legitimate decisions and their implementation. Legitimacy can be thought of as a state in which the use of authority is accepted and perhaps justified, at least by most, as appropriate. Effectiveness is more contested, as the dictionary definition of success in, in producing a desired result is now supplemented by concern to comply with other values, which the Minister has highlighted, such as fairness, equality, economy, efficiency, and sustainability. Within higher education, we have a complex and fragmented or distributed governance system devoted to implementing national policy decisions and the institutional priorities of a wide range of actors. We can think of governance of higher education as operating uh, at at least three levels or layers. At the government layer, there's been much discussion about the relationship of government departments, agencies, and higher education institutions each of which raises some challenges, particularly around autonomy and interdependence. The Department of Further Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science is an important new addition to the landscape, widely welcomed in the sector, bringing both the opportunities and risks associated with its greater capacity for sustained focus on higher and further education and research. At the second layer, institutional governance of higher education institutions, it is striking that governance frameworks, both legislation and codes, such as the recently published new edition of the Code of Governance for Irish Universities, place particular emphasis on governing boards and academic councils, and less on the relationship to senior management teams in higher education institutions. Whereas at the third layer, intra-institutional governance in higher education institutions, presidents and senior management teams loom large in the day-to-day -day strategic and operational decision-making, shaping both the effectiveness and legitimacy of HEIs. New legislation that the Minister has mentioned has the potential significantly to affect all three layers and the relative autonomy interdependence between these three layers. We're delighted to have at our webinar today an outstanding panel of five speakers to address these issues. In the first session, we will have a keynote address from Peter Marson, followed by a response from Pat Clancy. In the second panel, we have the perspective of a chair of governing authority, an academic leader and a student. And I will introduce the participants as we come to them in the programme. Questions are welcome. We've received some questions from participants in advance and invite further questions via the chat function on Zoom. Respectively of your time and given the commitment to keeping the webinar to time, I shall endeavour to hold speakers strictly to time and it's likely we'll have more questions than can be addressed, but we will record and carry forward questions into the future debate about higher education governance. So for our first session, a global bird's eye view, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Peter Masson, who is a Professor of Higher Education Studies, University of Oslo. Peter, you could turn your camera on now and we'll welcome you. Uh, Peter is a Professor in Higher Education Studies at the University of Oslo, extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University, South Africa, and fellow Steinart Institute for Higher Education Policy, New York University. We're delighted to have Peter's participation in our webinar today, drawing on his wide comparative international experience on higher education governance. His topic is Good Institutional Governance in Higher Education, the Act of Balancing Academic, Economic, Organisational, Sociocultural and Political Objectives and Realities. Peter. 
Good afternoon from um, sunny uh, but cold uh, Norway. Um, and it's a great pleasure and honor for me to um, be the first speaker in the panel and to yeah, and to share some of the um, findings of the research that we've done, the interactions that we've had with colleagues on this topic of uh, institutional governance uh, throughout the last decades with you as a start for your uh, discussion on good governance of Irish higher education. Uh, of course, I would have preferred to be physically with you in Dublin for many reasons, but this is the setting that we've uh, been unfortunately forced uh, to, to find us with. So I hope that uh, the connection with Oslo for the next um, uh, 10 minutes or so uh, stays well, and that that connection will allow me to share some um, bird eye uh, view perspectives on governance that are hopefully of relevance for the discussion uh, that you're having today and in the coming period in Ireland. I wanna start with a, a general question that many societies in the world are addressing implicitly, explicitly within a larger societal economic context or more specifically within the higher education and science context, what kind of university for what kind of society? where the institutional foundations of the university clearly reflect both the traditions, uh, the history, as well as the, the modern components of, of higher education. It is not a homogeneous institution. It is a very diversified institution. Clark Kerr already in the 60s referred to it as a multiversity. And it is highly successful in combining an institutional defense against the invasion of alien norms with adapting adapt, uh, effectively to changes in its environment, new societal expectations and demands. And what does that mean for institutional governance? What we have experienced in higher education is a dominant reform narrative with respect to higher education governance and the emergence since the 1980s of a modernization agenda for um, higher education governance with these features that you, that you um, I'm sure recognize that are in, in various forms incorporated in national reform agendas around the professionalization of leadership and management, around funding, diversifying funding, around the contribution, the expected, um, if not uh, required, contribution to economic competitiveness and innovation. And this narrative has emphasized, amongst other things, the value of competition uh, also in the area of funding and has uh, promoted a certain kind of governance mode that has been uh, implemented and uh, further developed uh, by countries around the world in various forms. And what we can uh, currently in the, in the pandemic say is that this, this narrative which has been so dominant and which has been promoting a certain uh, governance mode uh, is now being challenged. The countries that have most, moved farthest in implementing the uh, agenda uh, are now um, in general also the countries that face the, 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 the most severe challenges in maintaining the foundation uh, of their higher education at the level where they want to be. We hear of uh, a crisis in Australian higher education because of a, a, a huge drop, the income uh, of international students in the UK where there's talk of maybe up to uh, 15 English universities that could go bankrupt, major crisis in various public universities in the US. So we have to re-look uh, and rethink uh, what this narrative actually stands for and how we can find uh, our way back to an, um, an effective and good understanding of what um, an, an, um, a good institutional governance mode in, in uh, our uh, current time and in the, the coming decade would look like. And for that, it's important to uh, take into account that um, this narrative, the reform agendas of the last um, years have kind of neglected the uh, important broad role of higher education institutions in society, which are not only of relevance for the econ economy and the private sector, but higher education institutions have a very important role in strengthening democracy, in developing and contributing to a humanistic culture, social cohesion, solidarity, a vivid public sphere, 
So from that perspective, we can say that uh, higher education governance uh, reform uh, efforts in the coming decade will have uh, a number of challenges because higher education institutions are not only um, responsive, uh, they also have a, a, a role uh, that can be re, um, interpreted as responsible, responsible for uh, key features of our societies and responsible for contributing to maintaining and strengthening these key features. And that relates then to the question of how higher education institutions and systems and those in responsible political situations uh, can contribute to an effective and appropriate balance between the economic expectations and all the other responsibilities of higher education institutions. So how can we interpret the changes that have taken place in the framework of the implementation of this modernization agenda? What we can see is that in the 90s, there was an assumption and an expectation that we would all move in the same direction. Higher education governance, certainly within the OECD countries, would become more and more uh, dominated by one um, principal mode, one set of practices nationally, institutionally, and in the end, we would have an, an homogeneous higher education governance, um, institutional governance practice around the world. But of course, um, the 2010s, uh, if not the, um, the early decade in, in our, um, in our um, age, uh, in our century, have given us a reality check. We don't see a homogeneous reform trend, which is new public management inspired, time lags and implementation leading to the same results in each country. What we can observe is variation, growing international divide. Professional leadership, do we follow a private sector leadership model uh, or do we remain also in leadership and management functions in higher education institutions, strongly embedded in the public domain and academic traditions? The minister already referred to institutional autonomy. Um, is there flexible room to maneuver for higher education institutional leaders or is it a conditional autonomy? How about what we refer to in our um, uh, literature as a living autonomy? So how is autonomy interpreted at the third uh, level, the third layer that uh, Colin Scott was referring to? Diversified funding. Do we see uh, the advantage of continuous large ba basic public uh, block grants or privatization of uh, institutional funding? Uh, for your information, I'm working at the University of Oslo, a large uh, research intensive university that still um, gets, um, uh, or it has an annual budget of between eight and, and 900 million euros and 65 to 70% of that annual budget is covered by a basic grant from the government. So we don't see a set, this trend into one direction, but variation. Um, and also when it comes to professional administration of, of universities, is it a support function internally or is it externally oriented, um, uh, aimed at accountability and reporting? And here I want to introduce the pendulum because we, we don't see a continuous uh, movement into one direction, but a back and forth in institutional governance. We learn. Universities and colleges are extremely uh, good at learning and at incorporating uh, both internal and external pressures for change. And the pendulum now, after having moved very far in the direction of this modernization agenda in many countries is moving back, not to the same position as before, but finding new positions with respect to these key institutional governance dimensions. In our research, we've developed and we've used a theoretical and analytical framework where, where we identify four different basic visions on institutional governance. From a Humboldtian Republic of Science approach uh, and a democratic uh, model through a model where governance, institutional governance is, is uh, influenced by a vision that universities are instruments for national authorities to uh, an, an final model where universities and colleges are seen as service companies which operate in competitive market settings. And if you translate these visions into specific governance components or aspects, you can see differences that you uh, I'm sure also have experienced in your interactions with international colleagues maybe even differences with, within your own settings uh, when it comes to uh, the role of governance actors and bodies, the leadership role, etc. I will not go into detail in, in this model, but it has allowed us to um, analyze our empirical data and also to understand why we see these differences in the practice of institutional governance. And an example 
from that practice and also the pendulum uh, movement is um, a uh, discussion around uh, institutional uh, leadership functions and what they incorporate and what they should represent in uh, England and Norway. In England, we have, uh, as, as I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with, uh, had a, a, a discussion in 2017 and 18 about the remunerations of vice chancellors. And it was especially focused around the situation at Bath University, which is an, an, a university which these characteristics, middle size, relatively um, a decent budget, some ERC projects, not very high in the ranking, um, high tuition fees, international students, but a vice chancellor with a salary of 468,000 uh, uh, pounds uh, plus bonuses. And the University of Oslo in the same period, a new rector um, where there was some discussion about salary also, uh, and the agreement was that the rector should earn a bit more than his uh, predecessor, which was in the end um, the, the, the salary level of 136,000. Um, on the basis of, of different principles about what institutional leadership represents within a, a European setting, England, uh, Norway, close but very different kinds of approaches to uh, institutional governance, the role of governance, also accountability. Um, uh, at the University of Oslo, uh, the rector is still uh, elected by uh, staff and students. Uh, so even a university which is, let's say, uh, on the performance level, uh, at a different level than the University of Bath uh, in a Norwegian setting uh, has a very different institutional governance practice than um, a university in, in the English setting. But of course, the pendulum in Bath after the, the discussions, to, to put it mildly, around uh, the vice chancellor's position and salary, the new vice chancellor, Professor uh, uh, Ian White, there's a remuneration agreement with him, and he has a salary of 266,000 uh, pounds max, no bonuses, etc. So the pendulum has, has swung back because the situation around governance had developed too much in the direction of the extreme modernization agenda. If we um, uh, finally come back to the three levels that uh, Colin uh, Scott identified and, and look at the practices, how are these uh, reform efforts and uh, initiatives translated and what, is the, what are the challenges here for, for higher education institutions, especially uh, throughout the OECD world, the three levels, the national, the central institutional one, and what I call the academic production processes, which takes place um, at, at various uh, um, departments, uh, centers, faculties, various structures within universities and colleges. How do the reform efforts um, affect the relationships? At the, the, the first set of relationship between institutional level and, and uh, the government, uh, the, the national level, we can see that there's a trend towards uh, an executive governance mode very clearly. Uh, there's also an increased, uh, as the minister was also emphasizing, an increased expectation with respect to accountability. So also when universities have gotten more autonomy, there's the expectation that they are, account for how the autonomy is used. And what is um, what has not gotten a lot of attention, but what is uh, definitely a clear feature here is the growing density of involved bodies and actors. If we go back a couple of decades, it was the, the responsible ministry and minister, the bureaucrats in the ministry, the institutional representatives, and that was more or less it. If we look now at the landscape, the governance landscape, there are all kinds of agencies. There's the European level, there are other ministries, there's the employers organizing, all kinds of actors and bodies have become involved, making the, the task for the institutional leadership not easier, to put it mildly. The second layer, the central institutional layer, there we've seen, especially with an eye on, on the increasing accountability expectations, a growing formalization, standardization, specialization in many institutions related to that. The centralization of the key features of our governance, management, administration are organized. So away from the traditional way with the, um, the uh, administrators, the managers, the leaders that um, had many different kinds of formal and informal tasks and the area of expertise towards specialization, standardization. Well, at the third level, the teaching and, and uh, learning uh, on the one end and research on the other production process, there we see um, also efforts to formalize, standardize, specialize, centralize the relationship with the institutional level, the governance bodies, versus the growing need for flexibility. 
the last decades uh, have led to a growing uh, diversity in funding, a growing diversity in expectations towards higher education. So the, the production processes, the teaching and research activities need more flexibility in their governance relationship with the institution. While at the same time, the governance structures and the processes have become uh, have moved in the direction of one size fits all through uh, the processes that I referred to here. So there you see a clear challenge of the impact of the national um, uh, reform changes and, and, re and uh, consequences and the growing uh, diversity and, and, and uh, required flexibility in the way in that uh, teaching and, and research are taking place and are governed at the, the, the third level. So finally, as my final remarks, um, this um, introduces for me uh, what we've referred to in, in our articles, the university governance uh, paradox. So the more university leaders take on and operate in line with the global reform agenda and the underlying ideologies, the less effective they appear to be in realizing the reform intentions. That is, um, amongst other things, a more effective and um, um, direct relationship between the knowledge processes, the primary processes, the academic production processes, and the needs in society. One reason is that um, many universities in the beginning um, translated these reform uh, agendas and the requirements, the professionalization, the diversified funding, um, the the changes in the, the way in which uh, certain uh, primary processes are organized in a relatively homogeneous way in line with the changes in the relationship between uh, the central institutional level and the government, the national level. But what we see is that the most successful uh, universities and colleges uh, in um, the countries, at least that we included in our research, are finding ways to balance the need for a more executive governance modes more standardized, formalized, specialized governance uh, procedures, practices, administrative practices, with the need for more flexible governance approaches when it comes to the primary processes. So with this uh, final um, indication of the way forward, um, also when it comes to dealing with the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis, I uh, hope, uh, and I wanna thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, this, this global uh, bird's eye view is of relevance also for the for the Irish discussion, and I look very much forward to uh, the rest of um, of this webinar and also to uh, uh, address any questions that might come up later. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. On behalf of us all, uh, I think the uh, I particularly appreciated the relationship you demonstrate between the vision around leadership in universities and those three layers of governance, the kind of challenges those relationships throw up, and that will give us much to discuss. I'd like to pass now on to Pat Clancy, uh, who's going to offer some comments uh, on, on, on the presentation. Uh, Pat Clancy is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at UCD and a member of the NUI Senate. He's established himself as one of the leading higher education researchers in Ireland over many decades and was formerly Dean of Human Sciences at UCD. Pat. Yeah, good afternoon. You might turn your camera on, Pat, so we can, there we go. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for your comparative, uh, your overview of comparative developments in governance. Uh, I think your description uh, expertly captures the complexity of the governance dimension. Now, in responding to your presentation, I've, I've been also been asked to contextualize the current legislative proposals in Ireland. Uh, the, these are designed to reconstitute, as the minister said, the higher education authority. Now, there are several key messages in Peter's presentation, which I would want to carry over into this uh, discussion. These include the importance of the growing external pressures on universities. These pressures uh, relate both to what universities should be doing and how they should be doing it. Also important is the interaction between global policy scripts, such as new public management, and the continuing distinctiveness of national circumstances and governance policies. In other words, it's not one, uh, one recipe for all. I found useful your four visions of, of university governance, these four ideal types, which capture different 
choices and different emphases for governance systems. But perhaps the most distinctive message from your presentation relates to what you describe as the governance paradox, whereby excessive control attempts can be detrimental to the achievement of the key objectives of the universities. And, and it's important that this conclusion is based on research. The other important feature which you stress, and indeed which uh, Colin stressed in the introduction, is this notion of delineating the different levels involved in governance and the need to look separately at each remit. The, uh, the, this re echoes, uh, in some, some respects, my favorite model of organizations that developed by the American sociologist Talcott Parsons, who argued that in every organization there are three levels. The, at one level, you have the, the technical level. This is where the professional expertise prevail. And then on top of that, you have a managerial level. Uh, and then on top of that, you have an institutional level, which has how Parsons described it, which sets objectives for the organization. It legitimates its activities and it provides resources. And Parsons' contention is that in spite of an apparent hierarchy, there are actually each level, each exercise a distinct a distinct competency which is unique to that level now I, of course having said that one has to acknowledge that the much of the complexity arises I, I see these as three kind of overlapping circles if you like and that each level but the complexity arises in the overlapping zones between the between the different levels now turning specifically to the irish situation as the minister said earlier, the HEA was established as an executive agency with devolved powers from the ministry. The model adopted was that the government set broad objectives for higher education, decided how much money was to be spent on it, and then the HEA had discretion in allocating these resources. And this, its executive role, if you like, was then supplemented by a, a planning and advisory function. The rationale was to establish a buffer agency to maintain clear boundaries between the ministry and government, uh, sorry, between the ministry and the universities, protecting the autonomy of universities while also securing a coherent planning and administrative structure. Now, as Peter has demonstrated, indeed the minister says, uh, said earlier, the, a lot has changed in the 40 odd years since the structures are put in place. First, the system has expanded uh, at least tenfold society's expectations for what the higher education system can deliver has grown exponentially. I suppose the biggest change is the expectation that the higher education system will drive economic and technological development with a focus on skill development, research, and innovation. The most important structural change in the role of the HEA was the expansion of its role to, which was previously limited to universities. It, it is now responsible for the Institutes of Technology and almost all higher education institutions. Indeed, there's no reason why it shouldn't be responsible for the remaining uh, HEIs. But um, in retrospect, I think the extension of its remit may have some unintended, unintended consequences, blurring the boundaries between the department and the HEA. The, the government department, having shed the day-to-day -day administrative responsibility for a significant part of the system, may have found it very difficult to practice what Guy Neve usefully called the self-denying ordinance of non-intervention. As far as the Irish universities are concerned, the dominant governance trend over recent decades has been a, a progressive increase in state control and influence moving away from Peter's Republic of Science model, if you like, towards the, an instrument for national authorities, and indeed with some strong features of service, the service company model. All of this has had major consequences for the on, autonomy of individual institutions, but I'm not going to discuss that. I want to, to confine my remarks to the other two levels. It appears that the relationship between the department and the HEA have has changed significantly at the expense of the economy of the HEA. Since at least as far back as the recession, there is clear evidence that successive governments through the, the department have wished to reclaim the powers which were previously devolved to the authority. The notion of a buffer agency is rejected in favor of a much more direct intervention of state. 
An early example of this was when the, the passing of the Universities Act, where the government attempted to greatly expand state control. That was attempt was successfully resisted in the Oireachtas, and aptly described by Stephen Headley, he says the government was powerful enough to force the legislation through, but not powerful enough to resist uh, changes which were explicitly designed to subvert it. My own interpretation of this is that it was a, a pyrrhic victory for the academy, as the government, perhaps learning from international trends, quickly found other ways of achieving its objectives by the strategic use of financial instruments and other market mechanisms, and more particularly by the use of regulatory devices. While there's been some legislative change, such as the Qualifications and Quality Assurance Act, and indeed specific legislation for different types of institutions, such as the Institute of Technology Act. However, a much greater significance has been the series of state regulatory initiatives, which have been implemented without any recourse to changing the legislation. These include the Systems Performance Framework, Code of Practice for govern Governance, and a range of public sector requirement codes. A consequence of this extended remit of state control has been a, de a decline in the autonomy of the HEA, the boundaries bec becoming increasingly blurred between itself and the department. Even the terminology used to delineate the change in relationship is significant. Recently, we were, only a few years ago, we had a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with you. This was replaced by a service level agreement. It's more than a choice in, of, of terminology, it seems to me. Turning specifically to the new legislative proposals, which are described as an attempt to provide a statutory basis for existing practice, which is an interesting way of, uh, of describing uh, purpose of legislation. The main rationale for strengthening the regulatory regime, of course, is to protect, on the one hand, public funding, and on the other hand, providing oversight into the quality of the learning experience. There's always been this duality uh, and indeed, a failure on one can be used as an excuse for introducing more controls on a much wider range. Thus, for example, the identification of some financial irregularities in some institutions represent spectacular own goals by the institution, in a sense, and can be used to justify tighter controls. The proposed legislation defining the new role of the HEA, of course, it now occurs in a slightly different context. We have a new a, exciting year, a new minister, a specialist minister, Department for Further and Higher Education. And the latter, as, as uh, Morris mentioned, is being, of course, much welcomed by the university. And particularly the linking of the research system to the higher education system is particularly welcome. The challenge, it seems to me, for drafters of the new legislation will be to redefine the two sets of relationships. The relationship between the Higher Education Commission and the ministry on the one hand, and then the relationship between the commission and the higher education institutions. And if recent history is to be a guide, I suspect the boundary between the commission and the department is likely to be the more problematic. Uh, and, and there is, even, even in the context of perhaps the, the, the creation of a new department with a strong policy focus may indeed even intensify the problem. Uh, there's a risk of overlap and duplication of effort unless the competencies of each level are clearly specified and honoured. The department has described uh, the uh, proposed role of, in the new the role of the minister and the department in the new situation as being responsible for national strategy and policy, providing a legislative framework, providing exchequer resources. And it also says it is proposed to remove itself from the operational role as far as possible these being the responsibility of the commission. Now, this, is, in many ways, is a restatement of the, the older, if you like, institution, the HEA. The principal change in the role definition of the new commission, as opposed to the HEA, is its responsibility to act as a regulatory agency. The existing system performance framework is to be given legislative backing in, in the new bill. It is assumed, but not stated, explicitly that the design and operation of this mechanism will rest within the competence of the commission. And this would be welcome, and it contrasts with the situation set out in the 2017 service level agreement between the department and the HEA, where this, the, the uh, systems performance framework 
was described as one of the key functions of the department. So while it's, it seems to me it's appropriate that the department, and indeed entirely correct, that the department on behalf of government would set out major objectives for higher education, it seems inappropriate that it would assume responsibility for a framework which in its 2017 version specified more than 200 indicators to assess performance. This level of detail seems incompatible with the role of the department as being primarily responsible for overall policy and strategy, not for implementation. So I'm aware of the time constraints I, I need to conclude. I, I want to thank Peter particularly for providing an insightful comparative perspective, which has set the agenda for today. And I have no doubt that it will stimulate debate and can influence the new legislation. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Pat, for those insights into uh, the changing landscape of governance of higher education in, in Ireland, which very nicely complements Peter's presentation. I'll ask Peter maybe to rejoin us uh, on the on the camera. Uh, we, we've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on one which reflects the content of a number of questions, which is to ask um, perhaps to Peter, how might university governance practices better promote consultation and collegial process of, of decision making, uh, particularly in the context of navigating through unpredictable and adaptive challenges such as that posed by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, it's a, an important question and uh, it's um, an issue that, for example, was central in the, um, the student uprising in, uh, at the University of Amsterdam that was supported also by, by a large part of the staff some years ago, which led to a, a radical different um, uh, governance structure at the University of Amsterdam, exactly focusing on this issue of co-determination, because that's in essence what we talk about. So how can we uh, promote um, and um, uh, also make sure that it isn't just symbolic, but also of use uh, to the um, development of, um, of uh, the institution through its governance structure, decisions, etc. How can we promote co-determination? Now, there are uh, very interesting um, innovations in this in, in various universities. Uh, and of course, one key element in, in here uh, is a digital technology. So how can we use digital technologies in an effective and uh, creative and innovative way to involve the university population, uh, the staff, the students, in a much more uh, direct way, uh, but still an effective way so that it works in practice in uh, the, um, the institutional uh, governance decisions. So I could... Um, the time wouldn't allow me to, to go into it in, 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 in it in more detail, but there are good examples of universities uh, that have been uh, creative around uh, creating co-determination and moving from a more executive approach, uh, which is uh, uh, hierarchical and top-down, to a more inclusive uh, co-determination approach. Thanks so much, Peter. We've got, um, we've got a few comments and questions coming through, but uh, I'm going to, I think your response to that question about um, you know, internal governance is a very good segue into our next panel. Uh, an interesting time, we're going to move on to the, the next panel. Thank you very much to, to Pat and to Peter. Uh, I'd like to ask our, our next panelists, uh, Pat O'Connor, uh, Cameron Chiron and uh, Catherine Day to join us on, on their cameras. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll welcome them. But th in this panel, we have uh, 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 the Chair of Governing Authority, uh, Catherine Day, uh, an academic leader, Pat O'Connor, and a student leader, uh, Cameron Cairo. And we're delighted to welcome all, all three of you on this panel. And I'll ask uh, Catherine Day uh, to, to kick off. Catherine is uh, chair of the Governing Authority of UCC, but also, of course, one of Europe's most distinguished public servants, having served as the Director, uh, Secretary General of the European Commission over two five year terms, uh, retiring in, from that position in 2015, but uh, remaining very busy in public life. Uh, Catherine, could I ask you to give us your reflections on um, uh, the, the position of the governing authority? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colm, and thank you. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon to everybody. I'm also going to share my screen with you. I hope you can see this. Um, I'm going to speak from my personal experience of uh, now five years of chairing the governing body of UCC. I suppose my main qualification for that job was that in my former life as Secretary General of the European Commission, I had lots of experience of chair, chairing meetings. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to speak about UCC as an example or a model, 
but I think as you listen to me, you will all judge for yourselves whether you recognize what I'm describing. What I want to do is to give you my own reflections on what I found in this five year period and the changes that we have worked on in UCC um, to um, ensure that we have good governance at the level of the governing body. Now, before I come to my impressions, I'm just going to have two slides that kind of set the scene a little bit. Um, uh, yes, so the first one is um, obvious remark, and we've heard it from some of the speakers already, that uh, managing a university in Ireland today, there are many masters. Um, there's obviously the very important relationship with the government, which is not only to do with funding, and um, we've heard about the wider role of that. Um, there's also the um, working with the whole concept of academic autonomy and trying to square circles there. Then uh, we have a student body that's very active and very um, uh, vociferous in claiming their rights and expressing their views as to what they expect from their university education. We have the employers who also um, are very clear about uh, the kind of graduates they would like to see the universities um, producing. And then we have wider society. And again, I have, haven't got the time to go into all of these things. So overall, um, I think what universities are facing is increasingly complex uh, systems and structures. And um, some of this has also brought about a degree of resistance from the staff of the universities who do perceive a conflict of sorts between what they see, some see as increasing bureaucracy, taking away from uh, the academic role of the university. Um, the second scene setter I want to just put up here is to talk about the size and composition of UCC's governing body. And I'm doing this because I think it's very relevant to the changes that the minister was talking about. UCC has 39 members on its governing body. Um, I, looking at the other universities, they range from about 28 in Limerick to 40 in NUIG. And we have a mix of internal and external governors. It's not quite 50-50, but it's close to it. Um, what I found um, interesting, and I want to comment on in a moment, is the fact that several of our governors are either elected or nominated by outside bodies. And this is true both for internal and external governors. Internally, we have professors, academic, non-academic staff, students' union, and externally, we have nominees from, uh, from the minister and from county councils. So my first impressions um, when I started to get to know the UCC governing body was, first of all, that it's very large. It's even bigger than the European Commission, and that's, that's saying something. Um, but what struck me even more, because I was used to dealing with um, meetings, sharing meetings with 28 uh, member states, as, as we then were, but what struck me as even more important was it was, and I think still is, unclear who governors were representing. Um, were they there as individuals? Were they there to bring the views of the body who either nominated or elected them? Uh, did they report back? Uh, to whom were they accountable? I found um, that this was uh, there was a great lack of clarity there. And similarly, um, I think there was a lack of clarity between the role of the governing body and what I would call a temptation of some in the governing body to want to micromanage the executive. And this leads on to my next point, which was also a tendency by some of the internal governors to want to treat the governing body as a sort of um, highest court of appeal if, if things could not be um, resolved or uh, go as they wanted internally, then um, there was a tendency to treat the GB as another um, occasion for uh, raising certain issues. Something that I think we're still wrestling with is an uneven level of knowledge between the internal and the external governors. Obviously, the internal governors know um, in intimate detail how the university works, what its history has been, what the past battles have been, whereas for new external governors, uh, despite the fact that we have, I think, a very good induction course, it's still difficult for them to know in the same detail um, how the university operates. I also felt there was a certain lack of strategic focus in the agendas. And because of what I've just said about the percentage of governors who were either elected or nominated, um, we had um, a lack of gender balance because it was impossible for the university to influence that themselves 
only having a few uh, posts on the governing body that they could determine directly. Now, um, the, so what, what did we do? Uh, we decided that we wanted to um, see how we could adapt the governance of the governing body within the existing legal framework. And we tendered for an external assessment and that tender was won by the Institute of Public Administration. And um, we spent um, quite a bit of time working with them before they did their assessment to explain um, how the current governing body was working and uh, what we wanted to get out of the exercise. But then we stood back and uh, waited for them to do their work. And they came with, I think, an extremely useful assessment of um, governance in UCC at that time. And um, first of all, they recommended that we should uh, reduce the size of the governing body. Fairly obvious to any outside commentator, I would say. They recommended that we look at the skills matrix that we had in the governing body and then try to compensate for any gaps um, whenever we had future vacancies. They also picked up on the gender balance point and they recommended that we, the committees that we have to the governing body should comprise both genders in the same proportion as the gender balance on the governing body. We at that time didn't have a nominations committee so they proposed that we have one. And they proposed that we redesign the agenda into three main uh, components. First of all, that there should be a consent agenda for non-controversial items. And any of you who are familiar with working with the EU will recognize that as an A point part of the agenda. Um, secondly, um, that there should be a strategic and performance section. And thirdly, that there should be a conformance and reporting section. So what we did was we discussed in the GB and we decided very quickly that we would not attempt on our own um, to try to change the size of the governing body. Um, it would simply be a waste of time and energy because UCC would not on its own be able to change something that has laid down its statute. But it's very clear to me that our governing body would be strong supporters of changing the size of the governing body via new legislation. Secondly, the survey of skills and competencies among GB members was very useful. We discovered um, that we had a lot of skills and competencies in some areas and that we were lacking them in others. For example, the importance of um, new build and ex infrastructure expansion is very big in the financial uh, and developmental side of the university, but we didn't have those skills in um, the governing body. We also then revamped all five of our um, GB committees. We did that to improve the gender diversity within the, the restrictions that we had, and we got, uh, it helped us to get a better matching uh, between those skills. And every time a vacancy came up that the university was able to fill on its own, um, we tried to fill that. We also uh, have been pushing very hard, both the county councils and the um, minister, um, to help us um, with that uh, gender diversity. Um, this has led us to use the chairs of the GB committees more actively on issues uh, like broad governance issues and um, getting them to work on cross committee issues and also to bring uh, um, an active input from their committees to the strategic discussions. As I said, we, we established a nominations committee and we reorganized the agendas. So um, that was roughly two years ago now. And I think we, we have seen some good results in, the, in that period. First of all, we are slowly carving out more time for discussion of strategic issues um, at the level of the governing body. We are getting now better and more focused input from the committees. We have delegated some of the traditional reporting and follow-up uh, to the committees and then the committee chairs um, speak on those points in the GB meeting rather than taking up a lot of time with um, committee reports um, as previously. I think this has been extremely helpful in leading to much more active GB involvement in the COVID pivot, um, which many people have already referred to. And we're currently um, revising our strategic plan. And I think we are getting better governing body engagement in that as a result of the changes that we have made and um, I think we're, we are beginning to see less tendency towards wanting to micromanage. In other words, a better understanding of what is the role of the governing body and what is the role of the executive. Now, 
naturally all of this um sorry i've got skipped one how do i go back uh, yeah so this is still a work in progress um, I think despite the fact that I think we have a very good level of governance, we are still improving um, the understanding of the role of the governing body, both among the um, governors themselves and also in terms of understanding across the university of what is the role of the governing body. I think we still need better reporting to the governing body in areas like buildings and infrastructure, as I said, where we, we don't have um, among the governors that um, expertise. Um, and also on issues like cross-college performance, uh, needing to understand, uh, to break down a little bit, um, a, a level of generality on the performance of the university. We're still experimenting with risk management strategy. We have a very good risk register, but um, frankly, it is difficult to engage governors in a meaningful discussion of risk management. So I regard that as a challenge that we're still grappling with. And we are also um, now reviewing the governance of our subsidiaries and the relationship between um, the governing body as the overall governing body for the subsidiaries um, and, and how we manage that into the future. So we're still experimenting. I was very interested to see Professor Masson's pendulum because I think um, I recognised in what we have tried to do in the last years as very much reflecting um, trying to get into a deeper understanding of what governance means for us and how we can engage everybody from the GB right across the university to, to participate in it. Um, I'd like to finish with um, just a few comments on what I see as important for governance reform beyond UCC. Um, obviously, my first point is that I think we really badly need to reduce the size of governing authorities, I would say to something like 10 or 12. Um, but that would um, has to be done on, a, on an overall national basis. And it will require quite a lot of soul searching um, as to what, what are the functions of the governing body. Secondly, um, I think we would usefully, should usefully review the role of ministerial and other nominees. In other words, um, why are they there? Who are they representing? To whom do they report? Uh, where, where does their accountability lie? I think it's very important to clarify these things um, before a new, a new type of governing body would be created. And I know that a number of our um, nominees um, have experienced some difficulty with this. Um, secondly, I would echo um, what everybody has said about building a new partnership between universities and our much welcomed new department. I think in the austerity times, um, there was a sense of um, a certain amount of command and control. And um, also on the part of the universities, um, a degree of creeping dependency coming into the relationship. And I found this very odd, given that pre-COVID, um, the universities received less than 50% of their funding from the state. So I think um, everybody has an interest, an interest in building a new partnership that can reflect both a sort of grown up understanding of accountability and the need for transparency, but also um, the need for a positive atmosphere in which that new uh, partnership uh, can prosper and flourish. And finally, I see as another challenge for the universities, first of all, to, to, to go deeply into the consequences of uh, cooperation at third level between the universities themselves um, and also between all wider third level bodies. And I, I see all of these through the lens of, um, of, of the sharing the governance challenge. So we're being very conscious of the time, the limited time available, I'm going to stop there. But um, as you have heard, they were sort of personal reflections. Uh, and as I say, you will all either share or disagree to a certain extent with the experience based on the, the universities or third level education um, institution that you know best. But thank you for the opportunity to participate today and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Catherine. It's very really fascinating to hear from the coalface how the lead you've taken on making the, governing authority, the current governing authority structures work for the institutional needs of UCC uh, then speaks to the need for legislative reform to address the issues that can't be addressed within the uh, current framework. It's uh, really valuable. Um, I'm now allowed to go on to an academic view from Professor Pat O'Connor, 
uh, Pat O'Connor is Professor Emeritus of Sociology and Sociology at the University of Limerick and a visiting professor at the UCT Geary Institute of Public Policy. She's one of Ireland's leading sociologists and is particularly interested in, amongst other areas, higher education and gender. She was the first woman to be appointed at full professorial level in the University of Limerick in 1997 and the first former faculty dean at UL in 2000 when she was appointed Dean of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. And she was a member more recently of the National Review on Gender Equality in Irish Irish higher education institutions. Pat, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the NUI and the IUA for inviting me to speak. Um, my topic is the academic's viewpoint. Um, under the influence of new public management, the key focus in Irish universities today is seen by academics as research, particularly research output. And there is perceived to be a top level commitment to new public management and its focus on research and research performativity. And academics see this as reflected in recruitment and promotion decisions where research output and re a focus on research is prioritized. I've been struck by the fact that up to now, with the exception of Catherine Day's comment on the difficulty of UCC getting gender balance, there has been no reference to the fact that governance at all levels in Irish higher education is male dominated and masculinist. Um, it's sort of like the elephant in the corner. Um, but anyway, in the context of, of my 10 minutes, I'm going to talk particularly about data derived from a small qualitative study of randomly selected academics and researchers in STEM, including men and women, academics and researchers in one case study university. And I suppose the first and strongest point I want to make is that none of them embraced new public management with its overweening focus on research and research productivity. For information, those of you who don't know the Irish system, and most of you I imagine do, there are two separate career tracks, basically an academic one, which includes teaching and research, and a research one where there's meant, which the focus is meant to be exclusively on research um, and where the recruitment is on a more ad hoc basis. So in the context of the fact that none of them enthusiastically embraced a new public management, I want to, to differentiate to identify a topology really of their responses to what they saw as the commitment of the top, the top level to uh, new public management as reflected in research performativity and identify four categories of response. Pragmatic acceptance, alternative vision, rejection of managerialism or new public management and individual amelioration and i want to say a brief word about uh, each of these and try and give within the time constraints some flavor of the qualitative data obviously using pseudonyms so the first category the pragmatic acceptors the majority of these were male academics they accepted the focus on research in general and on high impact publications in particular but they, were, and they were, but they were critical of the criteria, the procedures, etc. But basically, they stressed the importance of an instrumental approach, the need to adhere to the rules of the game. The individualism implicit in managerialism and new public management emerged in some of their responses. For example, Dale, a male academic in a permanent position, stressed being self-interested, quote, guard your time. The department is important and you have to contribute but do it in a way that makes sense for you long term. You don't get to publish lots and lots of papers if you're constantly doing stuff for other people. Do contribute in a way that makes sense for you long term. So obviously his approach had, has implications for academic citizenship and for the um, uh, service and student focus, which we take as an important minister referred to. Um, in his address. So these pragmatic acceptors, the majority were male academics who were arguably best positioned to know the informal rules of the game and to play it to their advantage. The second group had an alternative vision of the nature and purpose of education. Now for some of them, this group included both men and women, but there were no male academics in this group. So the suggestion is male academics didn't, in this case, feel the need to have an alternative vision. 
So the actual alternative vision varied. For some, it was industry focused, a view of course echoed by the EU and um, uh, uh, by um, new public management. But there, uh, some of them adverted to the fact that there is a tension between facilitating industry and producing prestigious research publications. For example, Carl, a male academic said, quote, if you go to industry, they want a solution in the next three months not in the next year or three or four years. There were others whose focus, whose alternative view of the purpose and nature of education was one which was, um, had a focus on professional projects, on their student experiences, on curiosity-driven scientific activities, which they did not see as being valued by a new public management. For example, Margaret, an academic, rejected publication metrics her focus was on building up her professional area inside and outside academia so as to give a future to her students quote i chose this could have been five journal publications but i have absolutely no interest in those peer-reviewed publications for the sake of doing them men male researchers in this category focused on the reactivation of what they saw as the ultimate purpose of higher education namely asking challenging scientific questions. The key issue, for example, in one race for Walter, a researcher was the pleasure to be got from asking, quote, fundamental questions about the world we live in, things that intrigue me. They rejected managerialist, he rejected, and those who had this view rejected managerialist performativity in the interests of curiosity-driven scientific research, which was their vision of higher education. All of those in this second category had an alternative vision for higher education to the managerialist one. Their indifference to promotion or even to security of tenure meant that it had little hold over them. As I said, this category included both men and women, but no male academics. The third category rejected new public management. In ad and they advocated for a better work-life balance in higher education. And typically this discourse is assumed to be one endorsed by women, um, but in fact in the present study it was men who were most likely to see managerialist performativity as requiring two great sacrifices of family and personal life. For example, Danny, a male academic on a five-year contract, saw research as of little importance to him since, quote, he's not a career person. I wouldn't be sorted to high office or anything like that. I can go further, but do I really want to and give up a certain work-life balance?" End of quote. Jeff, another academic, um, basically saw himself as not tied into this trajectory from junior lecturer to professor. Quote, he said, you sacrifice so much, yeah, and you sacrifice your own personal space and time. The very successful experts, they don't really have anything else going on in their lives. And there is a result, bad fathers, bad parents, bad husbands, bad friends, because they don't have the time for anything else. So the majority of those in this category were male academics, they, which at the very least suggests that this counter-hegemonic discourse is no longer a specifically female one. The fourth and final category I want to talk about is the individual amelioration one. These, th those in this category were m men and women, re all researchers on contracts of various lengths, some including contracts of indefinite duration, but they were disillusioned with their career path. They attempted to ameliorate its negative effects by, quote, helping out academics with academics in the current climate, devalued teaching and administrative duties, or through informal power sponsorship relationships all with the view of increasing their own chances of an academic position. For example, Jimmy said, quote, a PhD these days doesn't open the door. He liked research, but he really did not see it as leading to what he called a full academic role. To get a full academic role, these researchers thought that as well as needing a track record of research funding, you need a track record of student supervision, you need a track record of teaching, and you need a track record of publications. Without this, as they saw it at the end, quote, at the end of the five years, I'm gone. It's a road to nowhere, really. For women researchers, there was additional pressure since maternity leave could jeopardize their fragile possibility of accessing a permanent academic position. 
all of those in this category individual amelioration were researchers, both men and women, who tried to ameliorate the limitations of their career path by moving or trying to position themselves to move to an academic position. So to conclude, what I've been talking about, I've been uh, suggesting that the top level uh, the commitment that is perceived to exist is among senior management is to a uh, new public management. But the responses of the STEM academics and researchers at a case study Irish University, which was characterized by a focus on research, particularly research output, their, their response to this was very different. None of them embraced it enthusiastically. The four categories of responses, pragmatic acceptance, male academics, majority there, alternative visions, both men and women, but no male academics, rejection of new public management, predominantly male academics, and individual amelioration, disillusioned with their career path, both male and female academics, who try to make their own situation better by undertaking academics devalued activities, which in paradoxically and inevitably decreased their research performativity. So new public management has affected the context in which academics and researchers work. It is perceived as a dominant ideology which has been brought into at the top, but none of the respondents actively embraced it. Each of their categorical response, each of their responses raises fundamental issues for management and governance and higher education. And indeed, I found myself uh, reflecting that um, many of the issues were actually also implicit in Peter Manson's address. Obviously, it underlines the importance of a radical re-evaluation of new public management and in the context of a gendered lens. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Um, higher education is, is nothing if not about the people. And clearly the critical challenge that you throw out as to how to match the needs and aspirations of academics in higher education to governance is of central importance in these debates. And that's a, a good point to hand over then to uh, Cameron Chiron, who's going to give us a, a student perspective. Uh, Cameron's a PhD student in physiology and former vice president education officer in NUI Galway Students' Union. And they were formerly a member of the NUI Galway Governing Authority, so lots of experience to draw on and giving us a student perspective. Cameron, thank you. Very thanks so much, Colin. Um, and I think just something you said there just really resonated with me that um, around matching higher education to reflect, I suppose, the diversity um, of those in institutions um, that we're representing. And I suppose what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so is both my own experience as a student who was um, involved in governance and involved in it in, in these sort of um, groups, but also some wider trends or some wider concepts around how we actually get meaningful student engagement in governance in higher education in Ireland today. Um, so as Colin said, I'm a PhD student currently in NUI Galway, um, but previous to that, I was the Vice President of Education Officer um, and the first ever postgraduate taught officer before that. Um, and so I've got a different wealth of experience around academic council, around Uderos, our governing authority, um, and engaging in, in lots of different academic um, based committees and forums. Um, and my own experience of how maybe the challenges I came across or the barriers that are there, or um, in a lot of cases, the support and, and encouragement I got from a lot of the, the folks in NUI Galway. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of touch on, on three different areas. So my experience in both academic council and our governing authority, um, my um, contribution to the governing authority review process that was carried out last year. Um, and then just a wider kind of discussion around the awareness of, of governance by students um, in our institutions and how much are they actually aware of it and what do we do to, to make them aware of it. Um, so as I said, I was involved in both the Academic Council and the Governing Authority. Um, and when I was thinking and reflecting upon my time um, in those committees and looking at well, what did I find was good or what did I find was a barrier? Um, and I kind of put it into maybe four different categories, um, looking at training, um, looking at the process involved in these committees, looking at the inputs into these committees, um, and then kind of maybe a more over, um, overarching one of the documentation associated with these committees. Um, and, and they all kind of link together, I suppose, in, in a certain sense, um, around kind of walking into, if we take a governing authority um, situation for the first time, um, whether it's on Zoom or in my case, it was, it was in person, and you're walking in as a student representative to a room with um, between 20 and 30 other people who have a lot more maybe experience than you do um, and all seem like they know what they're doing. 
Um, and I remember the first time getting the governing authority documentations and looking at the um, agenda, and it might as well have been in a different language because I, I didn't even know how to read it um, because the agenda and the structure of it was such a unique way to the governing authority um, that I had to ask the previous person that was in my role, being like, how did you actually sit down and manage this? Um, and how did you get through all this documentation? Um, and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of expected of a student going into these situations before maybe sitting down and, and going through it. And so um, the idea of walking into this room and knowing everything that needs to happen uh, is kind of an assumption that is made oftentimes for student representatives in not just governing authority or in governance based committees, but most committees that students are invited onto. And um, we assume that they know how to read agendas. We assume that they have um, access to all the documentation. We assume they know what they mean. Um, we assume they understand all the acronyms that we have. We assume that they understand the legislation that's behind all the stuff that we're doing. Um, but the reality is, is that no one has ever really sat someone down and said this before they actually join. And so we're already putting the student representation at a disadvantage because um, how can we expect a student to fully contribute to something that, that maybe they don't fully understand? Um, and this leads into the process that happens um, within our governance committees and within our different um, academic based committees as to where is the role of the student um, and how do I input into this and what is the correct process for having my voice heard and what do I need to say and how do I need to say it. Um, and sometimes when students are on these committees, it can come across that um, maybe they haven't done the research or they haven't um, looked at an issue in depth, but Oftentimes it comes down to the fact that they don't know how to engage with this committee because again, no one sat them down and, and talked to them through that particular process. Um, and when you're in that committee, and, and as I said, if we take NUIG as an example, it's one of the largest governing authorities um, in the country. And so um, when I sat on it, there was three students out of the 40 members um, that were present. So that means 37 other people who aren't necessarily students. And so you're walking into um, this particular environment where there's a power dynamic already created, whether it's um, um, kind of on purpose or not, there's a power dynamic there between what's viewed as the kind of the, maybe the adults in the room or the more experienced people in the room and the students who can sometimes feel very tokenistic of, okay, we've ticked that box, we've got students in the room so we can make these decisions, but we've disadvantaged students coming into these rooms because we haven't um, explained what their role is or given them training on what their role is or how can they engage or even encourage or empower them to feel that their contribution is valued. Um, and I say this as someone that was very lucky to be very encouraged at our governing authority by lots of different um, folks that sat on it that um, really valued the contributions that myself and my colleague could make um, and encourage us to do so. But that hasn't been the experience of every student sitting in a governance committee. And one of the things as well around um, the students that sit in the room, um, in our case specifically, there was three full-time officers in our students' union, but only two were ever invited to go to our governance committees. And so again, we were creating a power dynamic outside of that room between our own sabbatical officers because we were saying that two positions were more important than the other one because you've got to feed into governance. Um, and so those are things that we need to consider when we're looking at governance review. And I know there's lots of conversation and discussion around um, reducing the size of the, the, the size of the governing authorities. And oftentimes students kind of, get the, the, the bare end of that, I suppose, in terms of, well, we have two students, so we have enough. Um, whereas what we're looking for is more robust student engagement in this and more support for students engaging in this. Um, and so those kind of things that I was reflecting upon my experience um, really kind of is what drove me when I look back to actually get involved in the review process last year for the governing authority um, in NUI Galway and looking at saying, okay, I've identified these as issues. How do I make something happen to them? And so I was very fortunate to be part of a really lovely team that, that looked at the review um, or looked at the governing authority as a whole and really took on board what I was saying. Um, and I still remember it clearly. Um, it was very early into lockdown and we were doing things um, via Zoom and we were looking at kind of developing a skills matrix or um, kind of attributes that we would like to see in our governing authority going forward. Um, and I remember prefacing my comment with, I don't want to offend anyone on the Zoom call. But I think it's something that we need to discuss that the average age of someone on going authority is well above um, the age that I am. And I don't see anyone my age um, in governing authorities are going for it. And I don't think anyone my age is encouraged to do that. And so we end up with this, again, this paradigmic of older individuals um, having a significant amount of representation at these going authorities and younger individuals not feeling empowered um, or individuals who have different life experiences being empowered to go to these um, committees and put themselves forward. And as well as that, a lot of the attributes that we were talking about um, were things around industry or enterprise or research that are obviously really important things for a higher education institution. 
but not once until I mentioned it did we talk about anyone being student focused or talking about the student experience um, or can we put an attribute in there that certain amount of um, individuals on our governing authority have to have some knowledge of what it's like to be a student today because if we talk about the legislation being made in 1971 being outdated um, what it was like to be a student even 12 months ago is vastly different to what it's like to be a student now we put a lot of burden on our student representatives to come in and be that sole focus of the, of the student voice um, in these governing authorities. Um, whereas I think that that should be a much more collective approach from both the staff side of it, the external partners and the students, um, all working together to make the best possible education experience for our students that are coming into our institutions, especially now with the move to more online remote learning, identifying lots of different barriers that students are facing um, in their education. And so, that kind of leads me on then after that process, which was a very interesting process to be involved in, to have that input in and to really kind of hammer home the, the, the student voice and the need for student representation, student voices in these committees, um, actually established that we were able to, as a student cohort, um, when we voted in on the new DROS conversation, that we actually increased the number of students that sat on the committee. So now the three sabbatical officers or the three student union officers from anyway go away have an opportunity to feed into that committee, um, which was something that has been fought for well before I started on the governing authority, um, but it was something that took a number of years to, to, to get through. But um, thankfully we did get it through and we can see that anyway like Galway is committing um, in that sense to the importance of the student voice and the importance of listening to what students have to say. Uh, but when we talk about governance as a wider student issue, uh, I think if you polled most students that aren't necessarily in student union or um, very kind of active roles in the university, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you what the governing authority did or who was on it. Um, so probably wouldn't even be able to tell you what the president of the university or, or IT that they're part of, um, what their name was. And so that brings up a wider issue of how do we actually communicate governance to our student population? Uh, and how do we encourage students to be involved in, in this particular process, whether it is by putting themselves forward to go onto these committees or even knowing structures to feed back their, their voice and to have their voice listened to. Um, and this really comes from us as a collective, both students, staff um, and external partners, taking a very student-centered and student-focused approach to our governance and to how we um, engage with key stakeholders and think about the times of, okay, we've made a decision, but has the student voice been heard in this? Um, do we know that this is what will benefit students? Do we know that students will back this or will be behind this? Or can we say that this will um, be of a better benefit than something else to our student cohort and student population? And when we talk about that, we need to talk about the barriers, both perceived and real barriers that we or our institutions have put in place um, to prevent students feeling like they're empowered to have their voices heard. Um, you often hear rhetoric within the student populations of why would I give feedback, nothing's going to be done, or that's just a tick box exercise, or no one's going to listen to me, I'm just a student who has no experience. Um, and a lot of the times when you have students on these committees, you can have a lot of imposter syndrome of, well, why am I here? I don't seem as experienced or as knowledgeable as the person sitting across from me, or they sound like they, look, they know more than I do, or they sound like they could really carry the voice better than me. Um, and we've kind of created this culture around students that there's a power dynamic between the academic or the, the senior management and what the student is, and that it's a one-way flow of information that the academic and the senior management tell the students what's going to happen and we don't flow it back. Um, and so students have developed this narrative of, well, my feedback's not going to be listened to, or I don't feel like I'm empowered to say anything, or sure, I'll be gone in two years, so what's the point in saying anything? Um, and when we look at that, we need to challenge our own biases and our own stereotypes and our own ways of, of governance and, and how we carry out um, different things within our own institutions and think, have I actually empowered involved in this? Do I encourage my students to give me their feedback, um, both honest, positive and negative? Um, do I have built in robust methods of collecting feedback on governance reviews, um, on our governing authority, on who gets to, to, to be on the governing authority and who gets to run and how that process works? And if we haven't, then where do we start to, to bring that um, partnership together? Um, and what I'll leave you on here is kind of um, three, I suppose, three tips or three things that I would say for um, any institution looking to further their student engagement on governance. Um, the first one being training is so important for any student sitting on any committee um, to ensure that they can contribute to the best of their ability. We want to ensure that we empower students to feel like their voice is heard, valued, and that it's necessary. Uh, and the last thing is about partnership. 
No one cohort on campus can do this by themselves. Staff, students, and senior management and external partners all need to work together to ensure that we have adequate governance that feels inclusive and accessible to all. Um, and that we feel like we are having all the voices heard um, at our table. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to leave you on. Um, I'm conscious of time as well, so I'll finish up there. Uh, but thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the student perspective. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Many thanks, Cameron. Uh, I think the, I mean, the minister spoke about the importance of student focus in the legislative reform and the challenges you've thrown up about how to effectively engage students in participation in governing bodies and in other governance arrangements and how to uh, encourage a wider engagement of students around key governance issues affecting education uh, is, is a really important one. And it's, 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 really, it's really significant we've got your contribution today uh, to, to those issues. I'll invite um, all the panelists to switch the cameras on. Uh, we are uh, five minutes beyond the time we stated we would uh, finish. I apologize for my poor chairing. I recognize some of some of our participants may need to sign off and, uh, and that's fine, but I, would, I might just take five minutes. Um, there's some really interesting questions that come into us. Uh, this question, um, has there been an adequate shift away from rubber stamping in the culture of governing authorities in Irish culture? I wonder if Catherine might initially be able to address that question. Myself. Um, I would say not entirely, but I think um, what I have found both in my work in the European Commission and now in my interaction with UCC is um, a lot of new governance rules and obligations um, are, are well reflected by the people who issue them, but not well explained. And I think you have to work through um, a certain experience of living with them and then trying to adapt them to your reality. And I think that you, on that journey of getting to a, a real understanding of what modern governance is all about, um, inevitably you get through, you have to go through a certain amount of box ticking. The important thing is to, is to persevere and to move the organization beyond the box ticking to a real understanding of what, what is behind, what is the logic and the thinking behind the governance requirements. And I think that that's really when it begins to kick in then and you get buy-in because once people really understand what's being looked for, um, then in my experience anyway, most people uh, rally to it and build it in. But if it's just something that seems to be imposed from the top without sufficient explanation, then inevitably you're going to get a certain amount of, oh, we have to do this because they, they make us do it, but not that understanding that you're striving to get. That's Catherine. Anyone else on that question? Uh, maybe I could pass to another question. Um, a good question, how effective can the student union representation be given that SU representatives only have a, a one year term? Maybe Cameron might uh, have a view on that. Is the one year term an obstacle to effective participation Actually, in government? Actually, I think I think it's a, a two sided coin. Um, and I've had lots of conversations over my years in, in different committees on um, whether or not it's positive or negative that um, the student junior roles are a year long um, on these committees. And I think in the positive aspect of it, it allows a real diversity of voices amongst a, a very long kind of um, years, a few years of, of a governing authority. Um, I mean, if, if people were sitting on it for four or five years, you don't get that same diversity that you can get um, from each new student union coming in. And I think it also helps reflect what was happening in the student population in that particular year or time. And um, that's really important. Um, but I think going back to the points I made about how we empower students to engage in these committees, if we don't provide training on how student union representatives or students can engage in these particular committees, then we don't get the best out of them. Um, and I think that's where the negatives of these year, these roles being a year long um, really come into play because you spend, and I know I spent the first two or three meetings of the governing authority trying to get my bearings of things of like reading the documentation, knowing how to even input into things, knowing the process. Whereas if I'd been told those things in advance, I think that the contributions I made in the beginning would have been much more significant um, than they were. Um, so double edge, I think it's good and bad, uh, but I think it, it calls to a wider need for training, not just for the student representatives as well. I think that the staff and the external representatives also need a lot of support coming into these particular committees. Um, but I think it does allow for diversity of voices. So a general lesson around induction and training for the governing authority, governing board members, yeah, very, very important. And there's a more meta question here about the proposed higher education commission uh, both from a national and maybe an international perspective, 
can you be a funder, a regulator, and an advisor simultaneously? I wonder if uh, Peter or Pat might have a view on that. There were two Pats, um, either Pat. Um, either Pat might have a view on that. It's the other Pat. Yeah, I, I think uh, you can be a, a funder and a regulator. Uh, advisor, yes, but I mean, you, you, the answer is you can only do that if you if you get assistance in a way. I mean, one of the, the problems, it seems to me, one of the endemic problems in Ireland is we've had no kind of national discourse on issues in higher education. And, you know, and I blame academics as more than anybody else, perhaps, for not contributing to this, right? So in other words, that it, one of the things that a, the Higher Education Commission would have to do, it seems to me, is would have to get advice. I mean, I mean, before you can give advice, you need to get advice, in a sense. You need to be the master of, the, of, of all the, the details. And I think that's one of the functions of this new commission is to ensure that there will be some, if you like, stimulate some sustained examination of policy issues. So I, I don't expect the authority would have the answer to everything, but I think it should make sure that these, if you like, the best advice is sought. You know, and we tend to rely very heavily on OECD. Uh, you know, where I, and the OECD can give advice which applies to every country. I mean, I, when, I, when the last time they did a report on Ireland, I said, well, very interesting, but it could be equally applicable to, dare I say, Norway or Switzerland as well as to Ireland, because in other words, you need some kind of, you need to contextualize the, the analysis, it seems to me, right? And that's why we need to, to stimulate and uh, some research and debate on these kinds of issues. Thanks, Pat. Anyone else on, on that issue? Maybe we could pass on to one more issue then. We will need to, to finish then quite quite soon. Um, a couple of questions coming about how well equipped university governance is to advance questions of equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, Pat O'Connor referred to that in her presentation, as did Catherine Day to, to an extent. Um, but not just questions around gender, but also questions around race and ethnicity and, and disability and so on. I wonder if anyone has a view on, on how well our governance structures manage with advancing equality, diversity and inclusion. Pat, well, you're on mute. Pat well, O'Connor, you're on mute. You could come, maybe Catherine Day first and then Pat could unmute uh, herself to come in. Yeah, I'm unmuted, sorry. Um, I think they're not equipped, but I think it's all related to the fact that the assumption is still relentlessly there that universities are gender neutral, diversity neutral, um, and they're not. They are male dominated masculinist institutions. And so in a way, taking in this into account requires just an entire kaleidoscope refocusing and the governance structures reflect and reinforce this dominant perception, which is in Irish society, which is reflected in the institutions and in the governance and so i think in a way there's a lot there has been a lot of initiatives which have been taken since 2014 in terms of moving this on and um, the hea report 2016 task force 2018 the sally uh, senior leadership initiatives the sexual harassment etc but really the fundamental problem <laughs> is that it still hasn't embedded itself the idea that really we need to recognize that as there as the universities as mo overwhelmingly the governance structures like some governance structures still have 40 percent women even on them right and um, we know that the first woman at the presidential level is an interim appointment in ul we know that the percentage at executive management level goes up and down depending on whether senior management thinks it's going to affect their budgets um, so really in a way expecting governing authority to do other than reflect this is, it's just, it hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. I do think it, one key thing that would help is that basically nobody in a university should be appointed to a line management position, including the president, without evidence of gender and diversity competence. Thanks, Pat. So Catherine. If brought in at the top, it then will basically create culture change. Thanks, Pat. I think Catherine, you had a view as well. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I agree with uh, what Pat has said. I just wanted my, the point I was making is that the way in which people are appointed to the governing body already 
uh, in, in, in inhibits, if not prevents, uh, getting to a better gender balance. I mean, we have tried. Uh, we have, uh, for example, six county council members, and when we last uh, changed our governing body, we spoke to each county council nominating body, and we also wrote to them and asked them to think of the gender balance. And what did we get back? Six men. So well, even, even when we have tried, there is just a refusal to accept that this is a problem. Um, and my, my point is that until the, the way in which governing bodies are composed has changed, and why don't we say that governing bodies should be gender equal? Um, or have you know whatever percentage we want, but I would say gender equal. We're never going to change that. And then you know we get letters from the department and the HEA asking us why aren't we more gender balanced, and and we write back and explain why. So we're going around in circles, and and we need to break out of this if if we think it's important. And if we can't even do this on a gender basis, how are we going to do it um, on the basis of a more diverse representation of what Irish society now is, multicultural and very diverse. Thanks, Catherine. I'll take a final comment from, I think Peter wanted to come in. And the Cameron want to come in too. Yeah, just final comment from Peter and then Cameron before we go. Yes, briefly. Thank you, thank you. Th these are key points and very important points that Pep and uh, Catherine raised. Uh, and the question is how to move forward. How can we find arenas where we really can um, look at ways in which to um, address these issues of, of gender uh, uh, equality, of the, the growing diversity of the higher education and uh, general societal population. And one area that, that, or one arena that I want to point to is the European University Initiative, where there is a strong emphasis on, on student involvement in governance, on um, introducing and, and addressing uh, values and basic principles of the European idea in, in university governance. And all the universities, also the Irish, I think there are seven Irish universities now part of an recognized European University Alliance have to, uh, in their joint governance structure, address these issues of gender equality, of uh, diversity, of student involvement. So that could be an arena where uh, uh, there's also a, a possibility to uh, influence positively national debates that might be, as some of you have referred to, uh, stuck within uh, traditional uh, national settings. Thanks, Peter and Cameron. I suppose just really briefly, just on, on the um, equality and diversity side, I think that isn't limited to the, the staff or external. I think it also needs to be reflected in the student cohort um, that we involve in governance. Um, and that leads to kind of empowering more diverse people to run for um, different committees, looking at the way that we actually curate and culture student representation at our committees. Do we just always default go to student union? And is that what we should do? And how should we actually um, look at effective um, communication, effective representation of students? Um, like from my own point of view, um, I don't know of any other trans person that sat on governing authority before. And um, being that person walking into that room, not only are you worried about governing authority as, as a whole, but you're also worried about well, is my identity going to be respected or reflected in this committee? Um, and how do issues of that um, are dealt with? And I think that's something that a lot of students who are from diverse backgrounds and diverse um, kind of um, initiatives have concerns about is, well, if I go to this committee, are the people in this committee and setting it up in any ways knowledgeable about my identity, my background, the, the supports and, and stuff that I need and is this accessible to me? Um, and I think that's a wider conversation that we need to have about student representation um, across the board, um, but something not to be kind of left out either. Thanks, Cameron. And my thanks to, to all our panelists, uh, to Cameron, uh, Catherine, Peter, uh, Pat, and Pat, two Pats, Pat O'Connor and Pat Clancy. Um, you know, we've, we've had a wonderful traversing of a very wide range of issues uh, in, a, in a remarkably short space of time. And we've had some stimulating questions and haven't been able to take all the questions. And I think my suggestion to our, our hosts today, the National University of Ireland and the Irish University Association is that a way to follow up from these fantastic presentations would be to take this into more of a workshop mode for the next gathering so that all the people participating on the Zoom today, many of you in a more passive way, would have an opportunity to participate more, more actively in, in these very significant debates about how we can recraft, what challenges we face and how we can recraft uh, governance of higher education in Ireland to match the ambitions that we have as a country and the ambitions that we have for our higher education institutions. Uh, the only person who's let you down is your chair, uh, as I have allowed, allowed, allowed us to trespass 
uh, on time beyond uh, the limit. I hope you'll excuse me for that. I, I didn't want to stop people uh, and I didn't want to not have a little bit of discussion, but I will call a, a halt now. And uh, again, thank, thank all our, our speakers and particular thanks to Peter as our keynote speaker come and give us international perspective and thank all our participants, everyone who's been on the, on the call who are able to be able to contribute further to further debates about governance for higher education in Ireland over coming weeks and months. Thank you all. We'll sign off there and wish you all a, a good day and when it comes, a very good weekend. Thank you, Verano. Thank you. Thanks.